بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful the most gracious the most merciful think of those two words those two names of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the name of allah the most gracious the most merciful we ask allah of his mercy amen alhamdulillah was salatu was salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in we send we praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send blessings and salutations upon muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his household his entire family and all his companions, may Allah bless them all, for indeed they have struggled and strove through the years in order to pass the deen down in a way that it came to us today, sitting here at this beautiful masjid in this area, par- panorama, if I'm not mistaken. Everywhere you look, there are windows. And these windows, when you look through them, including those seated at the back there, you have a panoramic view. Am I right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to count His favors upon us. This afternoon, we were taking a drive through Cape Town. And I noticed something unique that I've picked up before. But every time I see it, I thank Allah. And I want to share it with you because the people of a city do not realize what it has more than those who come from outside and they see the beauty. So people go to some areas because they want the beach. They go to some countries because Zanzibar, you know, because they want, mashallah, the ocean and the beautiful beaches and so on. Some people go to some other places, Kenya, for example, because they want safari. Some people go somewhere because they want to do mountain climbing. Some people want to go fishing. Some people perhaps would like to do so many different things. Guess what? In Cape Town, you have it all, all of it. You look onto one side, you see the mountains. You see the greenery, flora and fauna. Those who are into roses and flowers and so on. I don't mean women. I mean roses, real roses and flowers, so on. Subhanallah, you would find it here in Cape Town. If you would like to go, for example, for the ocean, you see it there. You want to go and see both oceans. You can see both of them, subhanallah, not too far off. You have the safari here. You have so many other and top quality. You have beautiful infrastructure. You have, mashallah, so many facilities and you have a lot to thank Allah. On top of that, you have a bigger gift than just the scenery. The scenery is one thing, but the people make it even better. And the deen within the people makes it like a cherry on the cake. Subhanallah. You have Islam that is felt as soon as you land. Subhanallah. Before you land, from the air, you can witness that there are masajid. And these masajid, no joke, they are full. Alhamdulillah. We don't even have the size that we want. We would like a bigger masjid. Didn't you hear the imam say, Inshallah, the next time you come, we will have a big masjid. Alhamdulillah. I'm confident that from amongst you, there will be those who will make that happen by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have a lot to thank Allah for, don't we? We know we have the biggest gift, which is Iman. And the fact that we are followers of the greatest of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the biggest gift. We don't have a gift bigger than that. We actually don't. That, if you have that on its own, even if you are a pauper, even if you are struggling to make ends meet, wallahi, that is the gift. You might lose the dunya, but you always have the akhirah. And in fact, if you have that gift, you will be content in this world no matter what you have. You'll always be a happy person because you understand. Now, this evening I'd like to speak about something absolutely important. I firmly believe that all of us, without exception, we have goodness in our hearts. Every one of us, including a person who may be addicted to, you know, that which is unacceptable. A person who's committing sin, a person who knows he's doing wrong, but in his heart there is some goodness. Allah has not kept a heart whereby there is not even a flicker of goodness amongst us who declare La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah because that itself is a burning flame inside of you. In fact, rather than use the term flame, I rather say a nur that is inside your heart. And that nur will lighten up your whole life if only you allow it to expand within you something you need to understand. We all have the shahada. Don't we declare it? 
It is the most powerful statement in existence, without doubt. But some of us have covered it with a cover. Some of us have not allowed it to blossom within us. Some of us, it's only in a small portion of our bodies. We haven't allowed it to show in our hands and perhaps in our eyesight and perhaps in the way we behave and in perhaps the way we relate with our own maker and so on. So what happens? Let's face reality. I'm a good Muslim, for example. Everyone should be thinking that, Alhamdulillah, I'm trying to be a good Muslim. And I try to fulfill my salah as best as possible. And I pray that Allah accept it from me. The problem is when I walk out, I start seeing every other thing that's now distracting me. That's a problem. I go to work in the morning and who do I see? Wow. A distraction. In whatever way it is. Sometimes I might be struggling to make ends meet and suddenly there's a way to earn money that is not in the pleasure of Allah. But it's a distraction. Because shaitan comes to you. That's the thing. If shaitan didn't exist, all of us would have been perfect. Did you know that? But because shaitan comes, he has an army that sees you from a position that you don't see him. He witnesses, he sees, he attacks you via Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Internet, whatever else. You don't see him, he's on the other side. You know, we used to think to ourselves that how on earth, if shaitan was expelled from heaven, how did he tackle Adam salam and Hawa salam when they were still inside? They must have been, meaning what was it? Today when you know Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, people are stealing from the neighbors. You know that, you just know the password. There's youngsters who come on my street and they're sitting outside and I'm thinking, what's going on? I sat with them and said, you know what? Is there anything wrong? You know, it's a security hazard. I need to know. These guys are seated here. They say, no, 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 we are harmless. What do you mean you are harmless? Why are you sitting here up to 12, 2 in the morning? They say, no, no, there's Wi-Fi here. There's free Wi-Fi here. <laughs> Subhanallah. So in a similar way, what happens is the devil sometimes comes to us. We can't see him, but he's attacking us and he comes. And what do we do? We try again. We have Allah on our side because we've declared the shahada. Allah shows you the path. He tells you the plan of the devil and he tells you what the devil will do. And he tells you how he will entrap you. And he tells you when you are entrapped, what do you do to get out of that trap? You know, if someone had to catch you and they had to hold you down, what would you do? You cannot allow them to keep you in that way for hours. No, you want to wiggle your way, wriggle your way out. Or you might want to start pushing, using your energy, your might, and you want to get out of it. You want to get out because by nature, man doesn't like to be restricted by nature. So when shaitan actually traps you, he is restricting you to his obedience rather than the obedience of Allah. So what happens is, Allah knows that this is going to be the case. Allah warned us from the time of Adam alayhi salatu was salam. Allah says, Ya bani Adam la yaftinannakum ash-shaytanu kama akhraja abawaykum kama akhraja abawaykum min al-jannah yanzi'u anhuma libasahuma liyuriyahuma sawatihima innahu yarakum huwa wa qabiluhu min haythu la tarawnahum O oh, children of Adam, let not the devil lead you astray or trap you the same way he did to your forefather Adam alayhi salatu wassalam. To your forefathers, what did he do? You and I know the story. When he made them do something that was not within the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as a result of the sin, Allah took them out of the ni'mah that they were in. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused them to require clothing to cover themselves. Prior to that, it wasn't the case. This means sin brings about two big things. Many other things, but two big things. Number one is it removes you from the gift of Allah. Inna rajula la yuhramu rizqu yusibuhu. The Prophet sallallahu says, a man can be stopped or blocked some form of sustenance due to a sin that he has committed. What that means is the amount you're going to get might be written, but the barakah in that amount is snatched. So, for example, I'm earning 10,000 rands a month, right? Because I'm committing a sin, the blessing in that 10,000 is diminished such that in no time it's over and it's finished. 
But if I were to obey Allah, even if I was earning 5,000, I would be a happy man. And by the time I'm finished my month, I've got a little bit of change. Subhanallah. That's when the rand, inshallah, becomes a little bit stronger in value. <laughs> but at the same time, we need to realize that the second thing that goes is we become shameless to a certain extent. Some form of shame is taken away from us. And as time passes, shamelessness is interpreted in a different way. If you were to think of shamelessness in 1960, I promise you, if you saw a lady, with all due respect to men and women, but in, I'm talking of 1960, if you saw a lady in a tights showing half her leg, in 1960, she would have been considered as being in her underclothing. Do you know that? That this is your underwear. How can you walk out with it? Today, in less than that, they are considered well-dressed. Astaghfirullah. They will walk out and pride themselves. Didn't I show you how shamelessness is interpreted differently in different times? There will come a time and we are taught the statement, Munkaru zamanina aw ma'roofu zamanina mun munkaru zamanin qad mada. What we consider normal in our time was not acceptable some time back. And what we consider unacceptable today will be acceptable in a few years time. Subhanallah, think of that. It's a powerful statement, powerful one. Things change. Our duty is to keep on trying our best, to keep on holding things in a beautiful, modest, moral way, where modesty is very, very clean and clear for us. And it's the path that we choose. So shaitan will keep on trying. And guess what the sad news is? Or should I give you the good news first? The good news is, we will keep on bashing shaitan and we'll say, no, he tries to early morning say, hey, you slept late last night. Come on, Fajr is okay. Allah will forgive you. It's okay. Don't you know Allah is Ghafoor, Rahim? Didn't he start his talk by saying, merciful, relax, sleep. So, but we say, no, what are you talking about? It's time of Fajr, I'm up, I'm out. Subhanallah, what did you do? You put shaitan in his place. You won. You won. The mercy of Allah came. Your day will go better. You feel so good because you got up for Fajr. You read the Salah. Even if initially you did it at home, but at least you got up for it and you did it. Later on, you made the effort to come to the masjid. Subhanallah, the reward of it is immense. You want to hear a little bit of it? Your day will go beautiful. Everything will happen properly because you started on the right footing by the will of Allah. And then the hadith says, بَشِّرِ الْمَشَّائِنَ فِي الظُّلَمِ إِلَى الْمَسَاجِدِ بِالنُّورِ تَامِّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Give good news to those who walk to the masajid in the darkness of the night, whether it's Isha or Fajr, those who walk to the masajid in the darkness, that on the day of judgment, they will be given a complete nur. They will shine, shining. You're walking down on the day of judgment and there is a nur and everything is lit, subhanallah. Why? Because you in the darkness used to go to the house of Allah. Imagine if we can make the effort to do that. I was in Ghana recently and I promise you, I heard a lecture at the time of Tahajjud on the huge microphones of the masjid that was adjacent to where I was staying. And I was surprised because I looked at the time. They had given me the time of 45 minutes later. And I'm thinking, later on I got up, we went for salah, the masjid was packed, packed, full, full. And they had heard the lecture. After that, they read their salah. They were prepared and sitting and reading Quran and waiting. I, the, the, the salat al-fajr went ahead. And I came back and I said, what happened here? He said, no, we do this every day. It happens every day. The lecture starts at the time of Tahajjud. There is a lecture that starts at the time of Tahajjud. Where? In Ghana. In Ghana. Stop thinking of West Africa and Nigeria as a place where perhaps the Muslims don't exist. Wallahi, at times I feel they are more powerful than all of us. I've seen things with these eyes that have woken me up, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who learn a lesson. I give you another example. I met a brother who is not short of anything in this world. I promise you. Not short of anything in terms of materialistic items. And if you had that in life, it's not so easy to be very obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you've got things. You become indulgent. You want to indulge. Hey, I've got the cash. Let me fly here. Do this, do that. I do. 
it's not wrong to have luxuries on condition that those luxuries bring you closer to Allah. Remember that. You have a Rolex. You need to come for Salatul Fajr five minutes before those who have a normal Seiko. Or perhaps, what's the name of the, the other watch? as a Casio like some of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Because you're supposed to keep the time. You have a Rolex. But with us, we have a Rolex. It's to roll. That's what it is. <laughs> to roll and show your ex what you had. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. That's not what a Rolex is all about. It's for you to be able to keep the time. Now that I've got a very expensive watch worth a million, for example, am I here before everyone else to, to prove to myself and to Allah that look, I've kept the time? The answer is no, we don't. For us, it's something, it's just a piece of ornament. It's a jewelry, that's what it becomes. I met a man who is not short of anything. And wallahi, I promise you, 10 minutes before the adhan of a salah, he has to go to a, the closest masjid. He met with me, and before he came to meet me, he checked on his phone where the nearest masjids are to where I was. And he told me his phone rang. And I said, brother, you can answer your phone. He says, no, this is actually the telling me that there's 10 minutes left for Adhan. Please can we go to the masjid? I've checked it out. There are two masjids, one here and one there. This one is so many minutes away walking. That one is so many minutes away walking. And let's go. And we proceeded. I came to learn that years have passed. He hasn't missed that Adhan in the masjid. And if I were to tell you, he's got everything, which means, you know, he's not short of something material. The reason I'm sharing this with you is may Allah strengthen him and strengthen all of us. It must be a motivation. Us, materialistically, the minute you earn your first million, you start missing your first salah. May Allah forgive us. It happens. We become more engrossed in earning the next million than we were before that. May Allah forgive us. So what happens? I told you, shaitan, the good news is, we bash him sometimes. We win. He tells us, Ooh, look at this woman here. Oh, wow. And you say, what? Wow. I'm not going to look there. I'm looking down. What did you do? You gave him a knockout blow. Gone. He's upset. He's cross with you. He makes you start scratching. You start scratching. Why? Because he wants you to look, but you just look down. And you say, Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah. I appreciate what I've got. What's the point? I'm going to appreciate what is not mine and what I really don't have. I always give the example of people who drive the latest vehicle. The latest vehicle is only as late as the next one doesn't arrive. What that means is you bought the top Merc. By the time they delivered it to you, you saw on the internet that there's one slightly topper than that. You are now depressed because... <laughs> What you've got is no longer the latest. That's Allah telling you that you cannot compete with the dunya. The dunya will run faster than you. You cannot run behind it. Don't run behind it. Let it go behind you. You make use of what you have. You know, there are people who order a phone and they're using it and it's a beautiful phone. And when the new one comes, they've got nothing wrong with the old one. They want to change it just for the sake of having the latest one. And then they learn the hard way when it starts blowing up and they've got to start returning it and a big deal is made out of the phone and so on and so forth. Then you start scratching your head and saying, hey, I shouldn't do this. I should wait and see if the phones blow up in future. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Now let's get to the bad news. The bad news is the reality. We are human beings. Sometimes shaitan wins. And sometimes he wins in a very, very big way. So what do we do? A man, he didn't get up for Salat al-Fajr. Major, major sin. That's a crime. But it's happening, isn't it? It's happening. But I'm a Muslim in my heart. I declare the Shahada and I keep on, you know, I, I'm living my life in as best as I can. I committed a major sin. Sometimes you fall into adultery. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen all of us. Sometimes you fall into something bad. Sometimes you lied, you cheated, you, you were backbiting. Sometimes you deceived someone, etc., etc. What do you do? It's tough. Shaitan won. But guess what? There's that noor in your heart. What has happened is there's a cover now. It's becoming dim and dim and dim. You need to quickly do something about it. Do you know when you have a candle and you know that there are no lights and that candle is lit and you're walking and it's windy, what do you do? You protect the flame from blowing out totally. If it blows out totally, it's going to be a huge struggle before you get that flame back on. 
So now you hold it and then you stop for a moment and then you actually cover it and then you get something to put on top of it. Why? You want it to keep flickering. And when you get to a calm position, what happens to the flame? It becomes bigger. The noor in your heart, the wind is blowing, the, the anti-spiritual wind is blowing by the devil and the noor is now flickering because it's becoming dim and dim. You need to stop for a moment and think and you need to cover it quickly and say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, oh Allah, forgive me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us what to do. So I'm talking about how to wipe out our sins. How do I wipe out my sins? I've got sins, I need to wipe them out. You've got sins, you need to wipe them out. Some of them are major, some of them are minor. They differ with different people and at different times. And sometimes we feel holy, pious, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we feel far away. Sometimes we feel like we want to do good and we say, Oh Allah, I'll never do this again. And you feel like that for a while. And suddenly after some time, you go through another low. It is normal, it happens to everyone where fluctuations come and go. It's part of your test. Like when you go to school, there's an exam season. Even if you've done very well in the first exam, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to get anxiety attacks when the second exam comes. It's going to come. You might have passed one, you might fail another one. Big deal. You need to make sure you don't stop just because you failed one test. Go back, repeat it, write it again, pass with flying colors. You come out and you become the top neurosurgeon in the whole world. Can happen. Subhanallah. So what do I do? Because... Shaitan has a trap. You know what his first trap is? His first trap is to make you commit the sin. And you know what the worst trap than making you commit the sin is? To make you feel like that's it, I'm not going to be forgiven. That is the worst trap. Don't ever you dare think that. No matter what has happened, Allah has taught you a way of how to wipe out your sins. For as long as you are alive, you are breathing, you're, you have hope. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves never to lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Never to lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Surah Al-Zumar, Allah is instructing us. Never lose hope. How can you lose hope? That is shaitan's plan. You know why? When you start thinking, that's it, Allah hates me. I don't have any hope, etc. It is a stronger grip hold of the devil on you. Stronger and stronger. You are allowing the, the nur to actually become diminished, almost diminished. Don't let that happen. Quickly pause for a moment. Sometimes you know the candle, you really think it's going and suddenly you see a flame coming up again. You're so happy. Oh wow, this thing happened. Do that to your own heart. It's diminishing. You might have gone down the wrong road. It's not too late, my brothers and sisters. Turn back. It's never too late. Turn back and come back on the straight path. Subhanallah. Come back. How do you come back? That's a question. Number one, seek Allah's forgiveness, having hope in His mercy. When you ask Allah's forgiveness, never ask His forgiveness thinking, He's not going to forgive me. What's the point of asking me forgiveness when you think in your heart, Allah's not going to forgive me? You have to believe that He told us, don't lose hope in my mercy. So therefore, I don't want to lose hope in His mercy. I know I'm genuine. I'm trying my best. Oh Allah, I admit my sin. That's the first condition to admit. You have to admit. You can't say, hey, I, I did this, but you know, Astaghfirullah. Yeah, it was okay. Not as bad as that other guy. That guy saw what he did. You know, it was really, really bad. Mine was just a little bit, you know. No, no, no. No justification. Allah, oh Allah, I'm guilty. You do not have to confess your sin to another human. Remember that. That differentiates us from people of other faiths. Some people of other faiths, part of their forgiveness is they need to go to another human being who's probably more sinful than they are. They don't know. Today I'm standing in front of you. You have no clue how much water I might be drowning in. You know that? Yes, we have respect, mutual respect. My duty is to encourage you. And my duty is to seek Allah's forgiveness for myself and for yourselves. My duty is not to come here and tell you guys, come here if you've sinned, come and tell me what it is. I'll put my hand on your head and I'll tell you you're forgiven. That's not my duty. Islam is unique. You go straight to Allah. 
Oh Allah, I admit what I did. Who knows it? Nobody else needs to know it. Our mistake is we think, hey, you know, I did this sin. Now this guy needs to know it. My husband needs to know it. My wife needs to know it. Nobody needs to know your sin. Did you ever know that? Those are human beings. They are human beings. If you have usurped their right, then you return their right to them. But if you have committed a sin between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your Allah, my Allah, He is the one waiting for you to admit, Oh Allah, I did wrong. I did wrong. I really did wrong. Number one. Number two, to regret it. You don't say, hey, you know, Allah, I, I committed this, hey, but it was lack of it. You know, it was, it was okay. You know, hey, it was nice. You cannot say that. Astaghfirullah. You cannot say the stolen fruit was tasty. Don't ever say that. Oh Allah, stolen fruit. Number one, I regret having done it. And this is why the hadith speaks about how when you regret your sin, you are actually a mu'min. It's a sign, one of the signs that you're a believer because I'm regretting it. I've got answerability. I need to answer to Allah. That's why I'm feeling this feeling. I, I have to answer to Allah. That's why I'm feeling regret. A man commits adultery and then he says to himself, you know what? I shouldn't have done that, man. That was a waste of time. It really, you know, the sin is, it hasn't brought me any goodness. It's a good sign that you're saying that. Very good sign. It's a sign that you, there is Iman flickering in you. That Noor is there telling you, hey, this thing is extinguishing me here. You know, it makes you feel so bad. A person ate interest. A person went and did back for whatever else it was. Lottery or alcohol or so many sins that are there. You know, casino. When they start that roulette, what do they say? Bismillah ar-Rahman Come relax. <laughs> relax. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. <laughs> You're going to sin and you're saying Bismillah. You rather say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. Perhaps your hand will be stuck where it is. <laughs> so you admit your sin, you regret your sin. Two things, right? You admit your sin, you regret your sin. The third thing is you ask Allah's forgiveness. Oh Allah, forgive me. I admit what I did. It was very bad. I seek your forgiveness. And what's the fourth condition? I promise you that I won't do it again. I won't do it again. In order to say, I promise you, I won't do it again. You need to have a good flame. You need to have a good amount of nur. You need to have a good strength of your iman. To say, oh Allah, I won't do it again. The problem is, shaitan comes to us and he makes us say the first three. And the last one you say, hey, ya Allah, you know what? I don't know if it's going to happen again. It might just happen. Don't do that. I tell you why. If you promise Allah, I will never do it again. For some reason, somewhere down the line, you committed the sin again. You need to know your previous tawbah was accepted. It was accepted because when the four conditions are met, seeking Allah's forgiveness for a sin between you and Him, He will never reject that tawbah. He will never reject that forgiveness. He will accept it. Never ever did He say He will reject it. Four conditions met. Oh Allah, I'm not going to do it again. That's it. Somehow, somewhere down the line, you went out on the street again, you went here, your environment, something happened, and you know what? You happen to commit the same sin one year down the line. It is not connected to the previous tawbah at all. Not connected. These are now two separate issues. Although it was the same sin. Why is it not connected? Because at that time, you were genuine when you sought Allah's forgiveness. And at this particular time, you have committed the same sin again. You are asking Allah again. Allah says to his angels, do you see my worshiper? He's seeking forgiveness again for the same sin. If it happens thereafter a third time unplanned, unplanned means when I did my tawbah, I made sure I was genuinely saying I'm not going to do it again. Another two years later, three years later, it happened a third time. Do you know what happens thereafter? The hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says in a hadith Qudsi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells his angels, you see my worshipper is seeking forgiveness for the same sin he's committed another time. And now, Ushidukum. Oh, Ali ma'abdi anna lahu rabban ya'khudu bidhambi wa yaghfiruh. Ushidukum anni ghafartu lah. My slave has now known that he has a Lord whom he is answerable to, who can forgive him or punish him. I make you bear witness, O my angels, that I have forgiven him. That's the mercy when Allah says, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. He's not joking with you. It's not foolish. It's not something, Astaghfirullah, that's light. He is serious, Ar Rahim. He will give you more than you deserve. That's what it is. He will give you today our sons, our daughters, our own children or brothers. They do something against us. That's it. We, you know, close the door, 
chop the wire or the, 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 the rope is cut, everything, we don't want to know them again, pull the plug and it's over. Allah says, no, you come to me a million times. I'll come to you more than that. You keep on coming to me. Don't let the devil succeed. At the end of the day, it's the final exam that your certificate will be issued by, not the exams in the middle. What that means is, when you're at school and you had 20%, 50%, 60%, you passed some, you failed some, you repeated some, you carried on, you went up to matric, you did this, you did that. It took you five little writings of matric and then you carried on, you went to varsity, you did whatever, whatever. And at the end of the day, your final certificate at the university, as you graduated as a doctor, top, top result, distinction. What are you gauged by? What are you gauged by? The distinction at the end. I'm not worried what happened in between. I'm worried about the end. The hadith speaks of how Allah will treat us the same way when it comes to our deeds. A man will do good deeds for many years. Then he changes his life at the end. A person had flying colors from the beginning of grade one all the way to matric and beyond university. And the final examination, they messed up so bad that they failed. Do you think they're going to succeed? No. They have to go back, perhaps repeat, but when it comes to death, there's no going back. No going back. So what you've got to do, constantly seek Allah's forgiveness. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is known by us as Muslimin as afdalul khalqi wa akramul rusuli. Remember that. Listen carefully. He is known as afdalul khalq, the best of creation. A mu'min cannot doubt that. Wa akramul rusuli, the most honored of all the messengers. Perfect. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He never needed to seek Allah's forgiveness ever for anything. But guess what? He used to say Astaghfirullah up to 100 times a day. Allahu Akbar. Why? Elevation of status even beyond. You know, if you and I were told yours is Jannah, <laughs> Allah's guaranteed for you paradise. If you were told that, I was told that, I don't even want to think whether we would be here again for another salah. Astaghfirullah. Well, I'd like to hope we would. But I'm just saying that the thought, it can't happen because no one's going to come and tell that to us. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those, some of them who had known where they were going because they were told it through revelation, it made them stronger. Aisha radiallahu anha, she used to see Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa sallam standing in qiyam at night in salah, voluntary prayer, until his feet began to swell. And she used to say, Oh Messenger, aren't you a man of Jannah? Hasn't Allah already, you know, wiped everything out? You are clean, perfect, and you are standing up to this point where your feet are swollen. Imagine. Ask yourself, has any one of us actually stood in voluntary prayer until our feet were swollen? Anyone? Starting with me, the answer is no. I need to be honest. May Allah forgive us. Here's the best of creation standing, his feet are swelling. Why? Lesson for us. Do you know what answer he gave to his beloved wife, Ummul Mu'minin Aisha radiallahu anha? He says, Ya Aisha, oh Aisha, you mentioned everything about me and paradise and sins and whatever else, and there's nothing, and, and you're so clean and whatever, and why do you have to stand? You mentioned everything. Afala akuna abdan shakura. Can I not be a slave who is thankful? This is my gratitude. Allah gave me Jannah. This is my gratitude to Allah. My brothers and sisters, Allah gives you a rand, two rands, five rands. Gratitude to Allah. Come to the masjid early. Pray for Allah. Pray a little bit more. Open the Quran. Read more. Become a better person. Cut your sin and say, Ya Allah, you gave me my first million. I'm not committing adultery ever again. Not from far, not from near. I'm cutting relations with those people who are dilly-dallying in my life, trying to make me sin. I don't want it's out. That's how you will fight shaitan. That's how you wipe out your sin. Subhanallah. Allah blessed you. Count your blessings. Allah gave you help. You were sick, you had no hope, Allah cured you, you came back into life. You don't have to go back into that sinful way. Rather now stick to the path, Allah gave you another chance. That's a gift of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Live by it and you see the mercy of Allah. Amazing. So Rasulullah sallallahu used to ask Allah's forgiveness up to 100 times a day when he did not need it. With us, we need it desperately but I promise you a week passes two weeks passes a, a, pass, a month passes we have not yet asked Allah's forgiveness follow the sunnah my brothers and sisters of the best of creation follow his way 
and you will seek Allah's forgiveness every day. Seriously, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, what I've done. Oh Allah, I regret. Oh Allah, I admit. Oh Allah, I won't do it again. Forgive me, oh Allah. And you find the devil is gone. Now we have another problem and that is, there are some sins we've forgotten. That's how many sins we've committed. Sometimes the environment is such, your eyes fall somewhere, you don't even realize it's sinful. You say something, we talk, myself included, sometimes you're just talking to your friends, you don't realize a word you said might have been vulgar, wrong, unacceptable in the eyes of Allah. May Allah forgive me. Allahu Akbar. May Allah make me more conscious of those type of words. Sometimes you're sitting with friends, and you're just chitting and chatting and so on. And you might say one or two colloquial words which are actually derogatory. The angels are writing it down. You don't realize Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. The angels are writing it down. Just say, oh Allah, forgive me. Now, because we don't know of how much that happened, these are minor sins. You don't know how many happen. Sometimes so many happen. And I don't know. And maybe my life is being clogged. You know when you have unnecessary items going into the drain. You have a basin. You have a sink. And there's... A lot of oily stuff going in or sometimes, you know, you've cut your hair or something happens and things go in or you're losing a bit of hair, it goes into it. What happens? The drain becomes clogged. What do you need? You need a plumber. You need to unclog that particular drain and make sure that you remove the ganj from inside if that's the correct word. And what will happen? The water that was being clogged and stopped and the water that was now going slow, as soon as the clog is gone, it starts flowing properly how it was what a pleasure when you shower and the shower becomes like a mini swimming pool you don't enjoy the shower because that's not what it is you don't know you're trying to soap yourself and your feet are in the muck because the water's not going down what a pleasure it would be if someone could just pick that clean it properly take it out and tell you go and try again the next time you go into that shower wow you enjoy it so much don't waste water, there's a shortage at the moment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. So you go in and you enjoy. The same way we become clogged religiously. Take out the clog. How do I take it out? I want to explain to you. The Prophet sallallahu tells us, and this is from Allah. The first thing I talked about was major sin. That you require tawbah. I spoke about the four conditions. You know what they are? I'm going to repeat them. Admit your sin. Regret it. Seek forgiveness and promise not to do it again. Four conditions. Admit it, regret it, seek forgiveness, and promise not to do it again. Four conditions. Your sin is gone. Totally wiped out. If you never repeat that sin again, up to the point of death, Allah says, we will take those sins and we will convert them to good deeds because you changed your life thereafter. That is a verse in the Quran. Surah Al-Furqan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Except for those. Allah speaks of punishment and then He says He won't punish those who seek forgiveness and believe and do good deeds after that. We will take their bad deeds and convert them into good deeds for them on the right side of the scale and the Day of Judgment. So what's the condition of the conversion of the deeds? You sought forgiveness, the sin is wiped out. It's held in a certain place. You didn't commit bad after that, the sin is converted into a good deed. Allahu Akbar. That's the mercy of Allah. What did I say at the beginning? Ar-Rahim, the most merciful. Yeah, he's proving to you his mercy. But the minor sins, the hadith says, Atbi'is sayyi'at al-hasanata tamhuha. When you follow up your bad deed with a good deed, the bad deed gets automatically wiped out. You were walking in the street, your eyes fell somewhere. You saw something haram, you looked down. You went into the masjid, you made wudu, you joined Salatul Jama'ah. The fact that you did the good deed and you entered Salatul Jama'ah, the sin is wiped out while you were making wudu. Wiped out. You didn't follow it through the mercy of Allah. The hadith says, follow your bad deed with a good deed. It will wipe out the bad deed. How? Another narration says, Al Jumu'atu il al Jumu'ati, kafaratu lima bainahuma. Someone reads one Jumu'ah, thereafter they read another Jumu'ah properly. They were interested in the Jumu'ah. You know, you come early, you, it's not just lastminute.com. When you do Jumu'ah because you have to do it, but you're feeling lazy to do it, it's one of those things. Perhaps the farad is done, but you won't achieve the greater blessing of it. But on a Friday, 
Look at our elderly. They still have that in them. They'll get up early, they'll dress properly, they'll bath properly, they'll clean themselves nicely, they put a bit of itr. I still remember some of the elderly uncles, they have perfume, this old type of perfume, you know. It might smell like mango pickle, but for them, it's really a grand perfume. I remember one day someone gave me an oud, oud, very expensive oud. I don't know if you're aware of oud, right? I'm sure you, you guys are. And I went to the guy who sells the oud, told him, how much is this? He told me, I can't remember, but some price, big price. So I thought to myself, I have an Ustad, let me present this to him as a gift, you know. I gave him, I said, uh, you know, I have a small gift for you here, here it goes. So I don't want to tell him it's expensive and I'm giving you the top notch and everything. Anyway, the next day he comes to me, he gives it back to me, he says, this is smelling like achar. You know what is achar? <laughs> smelling like mango pickle, the pickle. And I'm like, what? Are you crazy. Okay, okay, I'll have it back, I'll have it back. Jazakallah <laughs> So you got to know, but I'm, the point I was making is some of the elderly, you find a small piece of cotton wool in their ears. Have you ever seen it? They put it in their ears because, you know, religiously they will go early for Salat al Jum'ah because they want to get that Eid of the week as an accepted Eid. We all say, hey, Jum'ah, Jum'ah, Masha, what Jum'ah? Yes, but what did you do to deserve the Barakah of that day? You weren't even interested in the Salah. You planning that you're going to go out to steers to have a meal at the wrong time. You'd rather go to spur at the right time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May Allah grant us ease. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Don't go at the wrong time. Plan to go for salah. Plan to go for salah. Jum'ah, your day must rotate around that salah. Because when you go and you fulfill it properly, you know what happens? The hadith says, the Jum'ah and the other Jum'ah, between those two, all the minor sins you've committed are wiped out because you followed the sins with a massive good deed. And that was the Jum'ah. Amazing. Al-umrah to ilal umrah ti kafara to lima bainahum. Another hadith. You go for umrah and then you go for another umrah for as long as your intentions were all valid and correct. The sins between the two umrahs wiped out. Here we're talking of minor sins because major sins require specific tawbah. Specific means you need to talk about it. Say, oh Allah, adultery happened. I was very wrong. It was very bad. Oh Allah, I regret it. I admit my sin. I'm not going to do it again. And I ask you to forgive me. But minor sins, we're talking of things that happen every day in your speech. You said something, perhaps you looked somewhere, perhaps a little bit here and there. You might have said a word or two. That's what we're talking about. These are sins. But if we don't get the forgiveness of the little sins, the hairs, even though they are on their own little fine strands, when they get together, they will clog your drain. How many of us have had a plumber come and he clears the drain and he says, this was all the hair. So much for head and shoulders. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. The hair has gone into the drain and blocked it and clogged it. We had to pay more to clear it than for the shampoo. <laughs> Subhanallah. But the lesson is, these little sins we commit are like hairs. They're clogging our drain. We become sluggish in responding to Allah's call. Wallahi, today I heard the most beautiful adhan here in this masjid. Lovely. The call for the, uh, the salah needs to be beautified so that people around want to come. You know, you hear a beautiful call. You want to come, don't you? Hey, let me go. This sounds like I'm going to be in Makkah today, man. Subhanallah. But when you hear, what happens? You think to yourself, hey, let me now. You know, I don't even know if I should go there. So may Allah forgive us. It happens to the people. It's something that it's not supposed to be. We are supposed to be such that when you hear the adhan, your system must never be clogged. You won't take moments or to think. You will come immediately towards the masjid. Allah is calling me. I went to Nigeria, one of the areas in the north, and a, another man, a wealthy man, he tells me, Allah is calling me. You are calling me. Do you think I'm going to talk to you when my maker wants to talk to me? Subhanallah. Do you think my maker is going to be given less than you? No way. You cannot be given preference over my maker. So these are the things. But when we hear the adhan and we don't feel like going, there's hay in your system. It's clogged. You need to clear it. Go and ask for forgiveness. Go and do good deeds. Do good deeds. They will wipe out those sins. You feel better again. 
What are the good deeds? Be charitable. Do a lot of charity. Give. Be kind to people. The same hadith says, وَخَالِقِنْ نَاسَ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ the same hadith says, follow your sins up with good deeds so that the sins will be wiped out by the virtue of the good deeds and treat people with utmost kindness. How do we treat people? All of you seated here today, all of you who might listen in the future, if I meet you, you meet me, you meet someone else, treat the people fairly with kindness, kindness. Something we are lacking in the Muslim Ummah today for a small dispute over 15 rands. This man is a devil. Devil. 15 rands has made you already say he's a devil. Who knows when you go on the day of judgment, you might find that the 15 rands were actually owed to him and not you. Who knows? It can happen. Then who will be the devil? May Allah forgive us. So watch out your words. Your words can clog you. I normally see the devil come into the people where sometimes it happens to us. Something life-changing is about to come in your area. And a few devils come in and say, you know what? Don't bother. Don't waste your time. Why? No, don't waste your time. The problem is a few hairs, that's all. A few strands. Don't do that. It might change your life. You might have a totally different perspective of things that you took for granted on a day-to-day -day basis. Learn, benefit, take, the, take whatever goodness is coming in your direction. Treat people with the best of akhlaq and character. That's what the hadith says. The same hadith that is speaking about how your sins will be wiped out. Now, why does Allah say this? I read in Salatul Maghrib this evening, Al-Qari'atu mal-Qari'atu. Wa ma adraka mal-Qari'atu. I'm sure we've heard that so many times in Salah. In that surah, Allah tells us that on the day of judgment, the deeds are going to be put on proper scales. Proper scales. So can anyone explain to me, there's going to be a scale on the right and a scale on the left, right? Two. So on the right side, what's going to be put there, please? Good deeds. On the left side? Bad deeds. Have you ever thought of it? That is telling you that you will have bad deeds. You're still a good person. Did you hear that? You will have bad deeds. You're still a good person. If your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. When the, when the scales are there, you know what Allah says? For as long as you have Iman, for as long as you have that Iman that you need, if your good deeds are heavier than your bad deeds, your bad deeds will be ignored and you will get goodness. Allah will send you to Jannah. He's not worried what happened there in the bad because your good has actually outweighed the bad. The problem is we don't know the weight of the deeds sometimes. You might say a small word of backbiting and it becomes two tons. You don't even know. It's two tons. The, the statement that happened at the time of Prophet ﷺ where Aisha radiallahu anha uttered a little comment about Safiya binti Huyay radiallahu anha or someone uttered a comment about another saying, you know what, she's a little bit short. She's too short in behind her back, which means she wasn't there. So it was said in a way that the person may have felt bad. The Prophet ﷺ says, Wallahi, if your statement was put in the form of a droplet of ink in the ocean, it would change the color of all the water. And with us, short and tall is, is a compliment. It's actually not even, it's considered as something we don't even think about. We say other things, hey, did you check the lighting? The newborn doesn't look like belongs to the husband. Man. <laughs> and we take it light and we don't even realize the damage of that statement. The damage of that statement. I know of cases where people thereafter have gone into paternity tests and made a mess of their lives because of some idiot. Astaghfirullah. I'm so, so sad to have used that term. But in reality, they are worse than that. How, how dare you instill a flame where there was nothing? You started and you triggered the breaking up of a home just because of a statement you uttered. I don't even know how that example came to my head right now. But it's a reality. It's on the increase. Subhanallah. Be careful. If saying tall and short was so bad, where are our tongues? So when shaitan traps you, how do I get rid of the sin? One of the ways of wiping out your sins, change your company. Change your company. That's the best deed you could do. If your company is clogging you, when you take that 
You know what do they call it? A Magdeburg hemisphere or something. When they actually take the plunger and they start plunging the drain, what comes out? All the rot, all the filth, all the hay, all the clogged stuff, part of the shampoo and a bit of the soap and everything comes out. Sometimes you find a coin or two, don't you? Sometimes you find a few other interesting little artifacts there which can go down in history. But you know what? At the end of the day, when it's clean, everything starts flowing. Sometimes when you do the plunger, your friends come out. What happens? Hey, this man is bad for you. That one, I'm talking now spiritually. This guy is the guy whom... Sorry, I'm not pointing at you, brother. <laughs> this guy is the, the guy whom... In his company, you're becoming bad. You, you're not worried about your language. Get into good company. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. O you who believe, be conscious of Allah. And be from among, be with those who are truthful. Be with those who are truthful. It will lead you to do something good. Those whom, when the time of salah comes, you've got five friends. Four of them are going to the masjid. You're the only guy standing there thinking. There's no option of thinking. You're not even going to utter one word. You're going to walk with them straight to the masjid. And you're going to thank Allah later on that you had good company. But if you're the only guy who's concerned about going to the masjid and the other four always keep you away, it's time to use the plunger. Allahu Akbar. You'll be surprised what comes out. So to change your company is a way of wiping out your sins. Because it's a good deed. You wiped out your sins. Change your company. Secondly, increase your link with Allah. Have dhikr on your tongues. It will result in you calming down. Alladheena amanu wa taqma'innu qulubuhum bi dhikrillah. Ala bi dhikrillahi taqma'innu qulub. Those who believe, they find comfort of the heart in the dhikr of Allah, in the remembrance of Allah, whether it is tilawatul Qur'an, whether it is the tasbihat, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, etc, etc, you find comfort in it. Why? The hadith says, indeed, the comfort of the heart is found in the dhikr of Allah. With us, that's gone. We never pick the Qur'an up. The week passes. We wait for the next Ramadan. And even when that comes, subhanallah, recently I have had this uh, large influx of questions regarding the khatams that are read on WhatsApp. You know the WhatsApp khatams. I'm sure you might have heard of that. Where you've got a little group and the people are reading khatams. And so many people message me and email me to say, you know what, I'm on this family group and I've been asked to do one juice and they want to finish the khatam in the week and we are so many of us and we need to finish it. But can I pay someone to read? Because hey, I don't have the time. And I'm like, I hope those who encouraged that took into consideration this type of people. Because others will just say, yeah, I read it, I read it. And they didn't read it. It can happen. And I'm thinking to myself, but why don't we read the Quran? We want to involve in things where we're pushing people to do things they've never done in their lives. And they probably would be dishonest to you and tell you, yes, I did it. Or like I'm saying, people are saying, can we ask someone else, even if we have to pay them to do it? Well, what's the point? I'd rather give out the sadaqah on behalf of the person. It's better. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. But the point I'm raising is for ourselves, read the Quran. You know, I, I had a group of youngsters who came to me and they started asking me, you know, the deceased. So we want to do deeds for the deceased. So I started talking to them, explaining to them about dua and so many other things. And then I told them, you know what, my beloved children, I want to draw your attention to something interesting. We have a culture and that culture makes us pray for the deceased. Okay, pray for the deceased. Sometimes at the expense of our own deeds. So we think that you want to build a masjid, wait, die and someone will build it on your behalf. You want to drill a borehole, wait, you die, someone will drill it for you. Not realizing that the real deed is when you did it in your own life. That's the real deed. That's the real sadaqa jari. The other one, perhaps Allah may accept it. Perhaps it might not be accepted. Who knows? If you, you know, when I fulfill salah right now, how do I know it's accepted? What guarantee do I have? I actually don't. I just have hope in Allah. So if I don't know if my own deed is going to be accepted, how can I claim that I did a, a, a deed by donating it to someone when I haven't yet done something for myself? I'm not saying don't benefit your deceased, but I'm saying think about have you benefited yourself to start with? 
A person frequents the nightclubs. A person, for example, does so many other bad deeds. They haven't even sorted their own lives out. And they have conviction in their hearts that I can sort out the life of someone who's passed away. Not realizing that if you as a child would like to sort out your father or your mother, a parent who's passed away, if you would like to help them, you need to become a better person because the hadith says, Waladun salihun yad'u lahu. A pious child who will pray for you. A pious child who will pray for you, will benefit you. So if you're really worried about your folks who have passed away, may Allah give them Jannatul Firdaus. May Allah give us all Jannatul Firdaus. You need to straighten up your act to begin with. That's the starting point. Become a person who's better. And say, look, Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah, I'm reading my salah. I've started doing this. I've started. Automatically, your parents will benefit from that. You are their child. So getting back to the point, my brothers and sisters, when you do a good deed after a bad deed, what will happen? It will wipe out the bad. Give out a charity. Do a good deed. Smile at someone with the intention of a sadaqah. With the intention of a sadaqah. The one young man comes to me here in Cape Town. He says, can I smile with two intentions? <laughs> so I was happy. I thought maybe he'll have two noble intentions. <laughs> you know what he says? One is for the sake of Allah. But hey, the cherry was very, very you know, good looking man. You know, I had to just smile. So, And I'm thinking, where do you come from? Well, he happened to be a person who was in Cape Town, but not from Cape Town. <laughs> so Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I told him, brother, you know what? You just need to, you just need to, <laughs> you just need to use the plunger, inshallah. Plunge out a few things and the rest of it will go by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Allah is most merciful. But in order to become better people and closer to Allah and to have your sins forgiven, you need to, number one, seek Allah's forgiveness. Number two, increase your acts of goodness so that on the day of judgment, yes, your sins will be there, perhaps. Those that you have not sought forgiveness from. If you sought forgiveness from the sins, they won't even be there. Trust me, they will not be there. But if you haven't sought forgiveness, that those sins will be there. But because your good deeds were so many, Allah will just say, go to Jannah to fill those. Have hope in Jannah, my brothers and sisters. Have hope in Jannah. I want to give you a beautiful, beautiful piece of hope. Every day, we should get into the habit of starting our day or sometime during the day, increasing our istighfar. That means seeking forgiveness of Allah. Astaghfirullah. Say it nicely. Say it with concentration. Astaghfirullah. Say it in English if you want to understand and to have an impact if you don't know the Arabic. Include the Arabic, but also say it in English sometimes. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. Say it slowly. Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. What happens? Wallahi, the angels are writing. Am I right? The angels have written. This man said, Oh Allah, forgive me. This man said, Oh Allah, forgive me. This woman said, Oh Allah, forgive me. One day you will die. I will die. The day is written already. If I'm in a habit of saying it every day, I will die one day and I would have said it that day. And if I died in my sleep, I would have said it before I slept. Do you agree? So what's going to happen? You sought forgiveness. Your sins were wiped out in the, say, say the previous day, okay? They were wiped out the previous day. You arrive on the day of judgment. You know how that's going to help you? Let me tell you how it's going to help you. Now I'm standing and the scales are put. And now all the bad deeds, or should I say all the good deeds come, okay? The good deeds are put on the right side. Everything, mashallah, it's there. The bad deeds come. Guess how many they are? Very few. What happened between the last istighfar and the point of my death? And there we are. Because that istighfar wiped out everything, isn't it? The hadith says, At-tawbatu tajubbu ma qablaha. Tawba wipes out everything that happened before it. When you become a Muslim, you know what happens? When you enter the fold of Islam, all your bad is wiped out. Your good carries through. Your bad is wiped out. When you seek Allah's forgiveness, the same thing happens. The hadith says, and this is one of the most powerful hadith. I love it. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells us, At-ta'ibu min al-dhambi kamalla dhambala. The one who seeks forgiveness from a sin is equivalent to the one who has no sin at all. Wow! What mercy of Allah! What have you done in your lives? Wipe it out now. Ya Allah, forgive us for our sins. So when I come on the day of judgment, I have a lot of hope because I know, hey, I sought istighfar every day. 
And when I come, I'm going to see everything prior to that istighfar is gone, wiped out. In fact, some of it might have been converted into the good deeds. They came on this side and subhanallah, I saw it. And I just need to hope that the weight of those sins is not the two ton sins that are being committed. You know, the major ones I was talking about. And then when you see the good and all the good you've done, you need to thank Allah. May Allah accept it from us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who have hope. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and our offspring. May Allah make us from those who realize and understand the value of the term Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. May Allah make us from those who realize that we need hope. A lot of us in the ummah, subhanallah, we dilly-dally. We go far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we feel that you know what? As it is, I'm a sinful person. Hey, I wonder if there's ever a chance of me to go to Jannah. Wallahi, there is a chance of going to Jannah. And the chance is real and it's great. And the possibilities are huge, but you need to work towards it. I can't say, hey, what are the chances of me getting a lift to Johannesburg when I haven't even gone onto the road and I haven't even stretched out my arm to to get a lift, perhaps. As soon as they see me, they'll probably, yes, give you where you're going, Johannesburg. What's the chances? Whatever they are, you stood on the road, someone came along, they took you through. What will happen? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the intercession of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I promise you, if he sees you and you are a follower of his on that day of Qiyamah, he will plead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you and I that, Oh Allah, my follower, my follower, my ummati, grant him Jannatul Firdaus. May we all be from amongst those. Ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad.